Hello and good morning everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jeff, I'm the director here at Insight. Uh, before I proceed, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which we're gathered and are learning today and pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. I'd also like to extend that welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us in the room or in webinar land today. Uh, make sure your phones are on silent, please. We've got a great presentation from Dr. David Lee. He's the Director of Old Age Psychiatry from Metro South Addiction and Mental Health Service. And he's also the Chair of the uh, Older Persons Mental Health and Alcohol and Drug Statewide Clinical Group. And he's here to talk with us for the next 50 minutes or so on the complex and fascinating topic of alcohol and dementia, sorting out the maze. So please welcome Dr. David Lee. Yeah, hi, look, um the background to this talk is, um, so the slides, Jeff, will I just press right. it? Yep. And do I need to press anything to initiate them? Arrow, just hit the arrow. Hit the arrow, yeah. okay. So the background to this talk, So and they can't see me, they can see they can what's see over there, see. so let's go to our slide. Okay, so um, this one's called Impacts on Your Life and Practice because I was too lazy to change the title page from the last one. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it is about, it might have some impacts on, on your life. I'm, not trying to draw out anything that's personal to you. I hope it has something that helps your practice. The background to this basically is there's an international phenomenon where drug and alcohol services are seeing, on average, um, the average age of clients is going up, uh, more older people are seeking help for drug and alcohol issues. Uh, and there's some evidence, at least from some countries, that the number of people who are significantly cognitively impaired and possibly with other physical comorbidities, that that's increasing as a percent of practice. So, a few years ago, um, you know, basically the, net, the alcohol, drug and alcohol network and uh, ourselves had a bit of a, a chat and we exchanged a couple of talks. But coming back to about five years later, uh, there's, there's much more uh, concern and interest both on the drug and alcohol side, the ADS side, and the older adult service side. Uh, to have some kind of collaboration because you know in the older adult services we're seeing more older adults um, you know presenting with significant drug and alcohol problems. and you know it's I blame antacids because oh and wealth I'm going to blame wealth and antacids and partly because um, if I'd kept up some of the habits I had when I was a, a younger man I could keep going because I wouldn't get as much I'd have lots and lots of medicines that could help me live dangerously. I would also have many more things that would help me live longer in general. So uh, across that time as well, the, the average wealth of our older adults has been growing and of course uh, everyone blames my generation, though I'm at the tail of the baby, baby boomer generation and apparently we're basically all we did was party after World War II. So a lot of those reasons are brought together to sort of explain this interest. Now, the other, the other bit of the interest too is that traditionally drug and alcohol services and older adult services don't tend to talk too much to each other because say in the drug and alcohol services project they did out in New South Wales which you want to start getting into as a kind of leading document if you've really got a strong interest in this area. It's full of you know very relevant data you know, in the Australian context and so forth. They started off by assuming that older adults were 50. So uh, unlike most of you in the room uh, that will qualify me for for being in this, yes, thanks for laughing, but um, for, uh, for being in this study, you know, you just, to be fair to you guys, a lot of the time your data actually cuts out at 50. There's all this gradation of information about people presenting at 20, 25, and then it gets to about 50 and everything's this kind of frozen arctic of real lack of clarity of who's doing what. On the other hand, you know, um, drug and alcohol services, and well, older adult services, are unlike, unlike any other mental health services, tend to try and stick to criteria and you know you can be you can be a bit unhelpful on the phone well we only see this kind of people and so forth but you say well hang on you know you guys deal with the kind of complexity i don't see very much or i'm only i'm seeing increasing so i know you don't tend to hang out with our age group but couldn't you help us out here because the assessment tasks look a lot like my experience of having worked in aged care my experience of having worked in general medical or surgical boards and so forth yep. So as far as I know, there's only one dedicated uh, sort of trial program that tries to formally integrate drug and alcohol services with their neighbouring old age psychiatry service in Australia. It doesn't mean that people don't cooperate, particularly as you imagine you get out to the regions. There's only two of you anyway, so, and there is no older person service, so what the hell, you know? So that's the kind of background to it. It got me interested in it, and I'll admit to you that I'm not a... Uh, addictions uh, specialist. Um, I don't think we. I don't think we had any psychiatrists who formally were recognised as addiction specialists when I was doing 
my training and I basically begged to go on the rounds of someone who was a physician in one of the hospitals just to find out about drug and alcohol. Yep. So, um, on the other hand, I am familiar with uh, complexities of cognition and uh, physical comorbidities and all that kind of stuff and it's really sparked my interest uh, in it here and we have been trying, certainly at a network level, Linda Hipper and I talk, you know, semi-regularly just to say, hey listen, what's in the space? And today's talk is part of that effort, you know, just to try and see what your needs are, you know, we can come back if it's helpful. Um, and we've been looking at our own drug and alcohol data, which I won't, which I won't present today, in terms of uh, older adult services in Queensland. Oh, wrong. So here's some, these are just slides. If you, let's say you're doing your masters or something and you want a few slides, here's a few slides. Most of them are actually from the Older Persons Drug and Alcohol Project from New South Wales. And they, they're, they're the sort of slides you want when you're given a talk to, to, to sort of justify your statement that things are increasing and I want more money. Well, they're not giving, well, they might be giving some of us a little bit of money, but um, certainly the demand is going up and the average age of various things is going up. So um, this uh, shows 10-year uh, trends to 2014 for New South Wales. And you can see here that, now admittedly, this is not all people presenting to specialist ADS services in New South Wales. Oh, by the way, if you're on the webinar, I'm now pointing at the screen, which is really helpful for you. So just imagine a slightly overweight, uh, middle-aged guy pointing at a screen, that you, pointing at your computer screen, okay? So, um, yeah, and basically their numbers of people aged 50 and over have doubled uh, and that this uh, particular graph um, stratifies these things. Alright, so, I mightn't know much about addictions, but I really want to, I think one of the ways of getting into the zone of understanding the dementia terminology in the substance use space is by starting with a standard talk that you might go to if you were like a carer or, or nursing or something like that and just hearing about dementia in 65 plus because a lot of the myths and a lot of the things that don't really fit well into the under 65 zone into the drug and alcohol zone those things are based on a paradigm that really fits 75 year olds but to understand most pamphlets and then move from there to your group let's start with the group for which there's most available information so just recognising that until about the 70s and 80s, there was no dementia. It took the six, through the 60s and 70s, it was a real challenge to the nation that if you lived to be 70 or 80, you were just destined to get dementia. Yeah? Whereas, you know, maybe 5% of people aged 70 and over in Australia have got um, dementia as a diagnosis. Maybe 20% of people aged 80 and over have got dementia as a diagnosis. In other words, good news here, you, know, you might be clapped out in many other ways, but you're not destined to get dementia just because you're getting older, right? And it, just, to, just to satisfy one particular concern, if you walk into a room in your house and you can't remember why you went into there, it starts after 25. And it's not a clear-cut sign that you've completely lost it, okay? And yes, you'll eventually find your car keys. Anyway, so, so here are some myths here which we're going to explore. The first of them is that Dementia is not in the book of psychiatric disorders. It well and truly is, together with a whole right range of other things, including delirium. So, no, most, drug, most mental health services in Queensland and many around Australia, if you ring up and say, oh, I'm having trouble with dementia, they'll say, well, you've got to ring somebody else. Just because something's, you know, a psychiatric disorder doesn't mean that, you know, it's going to be looked after. I mean, the <coughs> substance use disorders are psychiatric disorders too, right? Then there's this idea that Alzheimer's disease and dementia are the same. Well, as we'll come to see, they're not the same. One, dementia is like the syndrome you get, the, the pattern of, you know, behaviours and cognitive changes and so forth with the disability. That's a syndrome, just like depression is a syndrome and, um, you know, psychosis is a syndrome. Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of that syndrome. It doesn't even become a pattern. It, it can be bubbling away in your brain for 15 or 20 years and you won't even manifest. You don't and get diagnosed with dementia until you show that, but the process itself, that's the, an out, that's the Alzheimer's disease process, yeah? It's the same like if someone gets delirium, someone gets a confused state and they have an underlying urinary tract infection, the delirium is the manifestation of what you see, the person suddenly, you know, you're losing the, you know, great changes in their mental state over a short period of time, often associated with changes in attention and concentration, and the underlying cause is the urinary tract infection, say. So, if dementia is on that old-fashioned axis one that we used to have in the American system, DSM-4, 
then on axis three, which is the medical cause, we would have Alzheimer's disease, head injury, damage from multiple substances, strokes and so forth. Yep. Another one, dementia is always irreversible. So um, I think if I've seen lots of people with really heavy alcohol use who reversed out of severe cognitive impairment to maybe not so much cognitive impairment or even occasionally really no clear cut impairment at all, I imagine you guys have seen that too, particularly if you've worked in the hospital setting where that's, well, you have to work in the hospital setting and then go to the nursing home three months later where that person's demanding to leave because they've rehabilitated and dried out basically. So, dementia is related to particularly alcohol, an example of a dementia that can reverse in severity if not actually, you know, kind of, especially back in the day when we weren't, we didn't have, you know, very uh, fine grained tests, you know, you, you know, you would say, oh God, this guy's fully better, yeah? Dementia is always progressive. Well, it's not always progressive. And, you know, I've given you the example of dementia in the context of heavy alcohol use. But if you take someone, for example, as a stroke, and they get a, you know, there'll be a bit of cognitive impairment, maybe delirium, especially in the first months, cut to six months later, that deficit, set of deficits and function, that's probably going to remain stable for some period of time. And it may not progress. Dementia can be diagnosed with scans or blood tests. We do the scans and blood tests to try and help the person and rule out other things, but no. Dementia is a psychiatric diagnosis. You wouldn't run a blood test to diagnose a depressive illness. You wouldn't run a blood test to diagnose um, you know, an anxiety disorder. You would use blood tests in the context of, you know, say, especially an alcohol presentation because you'd want to know what else is going on. And it might explain some of the other manifestations of a person's behaviour or function. And the same thing is true for all the psychiatric disorders. And we're going to explain Korsakoff syndrome and where that's gone later on in the presentation. Okay, so uh, dementia is very important. This is a slide I used when I unsuccessfully asked for more money. Uh, and it seems strange that, that you know, someone from, from psychiatric services would be talking about dementia. I guess the thing is, the behavioural manifestations of it cause a lot of, our, of calls that need to be directed around various services before someone actually provides some assistance. There's a lot of compl complications that relate to um, mood and psychotic disorders that, are, that do get seen by uh, specialist mental health services. It raises all these capacity and forensic issues, um, you know, and it mightn't be the person themselves who rings up for help or wants assistance. It could be someone in the family. Yep. All right. So it's an important issue. It's raising an importance. The only good thing about the dementias is that they're really common now. If you want help for some hopelessly rare illness, you know, that's different from if you've got asthma or diabetes, you know. There's no leprosy hotline, I don't think. Maybe there should be. All right, so here's the scene, dementia 65 plus. How did they get there? The first struggle was to show that old age itself wasn't necessarily associated with just getting dementia as an inevitable cause. Um, yes, the prevalence of uh, uh, dementia rises for both men and women. Women tend to live longer because they're actually ethically more pure. Um, <laughs> but be, all, the, all the mental struggle of trying to, to be better than men eventually takes its toll and if you live that long, you're more likely to have dementia. Okay, so this kind of slide's been the same kind of slide for a long, long time. If you look at people who are 65 plus, a group that you guys don't see very much, the big action is in there. It, so this is a pie graph that shows that more than half, perhaps up to 70% of people with d dementia, the syndrome, where you've got multiple cognitive deficits that produce a significant functional impairment that aren't due to delirium, that aren't due to some other psychiatric cause, that of all those people who fit those, those criteria, and, and you take that person to autopsy, um, and you chop up the brain, 70% of people have who have been diagnosed with dementia in life, they show the classic findings of Alzheimer's disease, which we'll come to in a minute. But basically they are glugged up proteins inside nerve cells called tangles, and glugged up proteins on the outside of the nerve cells, but still in the brain's substance called plaques. Another proportion, so if you imagine going to the worst Aldi in the world, this is dementia Aldi, right? In dementia Aldi, you've got a shopping trolley, and the only thing you can put in the trolley is neuropathology. So you're going to go mostly down the, the Alzheimer's aisle and put a lot of plaques and tangles in the trolley, yeah? Then you're going to turn around in aisle two, which is vascular aisle, where there's small strokes, worn away uh, white matter, 
um, you know, changes in blood vessels. I think I put a few more cans of that into the trolley. And then as you get to the last aisles, I actually don't use the household stuff very, I'm not very clean. So I never get household cleaning products if I go to Aldi. I'm always interested in those kind of man toys that are in the cent central aisle. But anyway, I'm abandoning this analogy I had about Dementia Alley, right? So here we are in Dementia Alley. We're going to only have a few Lewy bodies in our trolley. We're only going to have, you know, a few frontotemporal dementia type pathologies. So if your shopping trolley is the one that fills all the pathologies that make up all the people who get dementia, it's mostly going to be full of these plaques and tangles. And some people have more than one pathology in the trolley. Yep. Yeah, like you, I've really put you off Aldi probably in general. Okay, so what are the other causes? These are things called frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, dementia in the context of hunting disease and Parkinson's disease, and a whole range of conditions we're not going to spend very much time on today because that's not where your action is necessarily. So what did it, and the other thing that's changed recently is that the way dementia has been replaced in the American literature well, in the American system by something called major neurocognitive disorder. But let's not confuse you. Let's stick with where we were only a couple of years ago talking about dementia because that's still in the ICD-10, which is how things get coded in hospitals and so forth. Right, so, in the, for, and still this works pretty much clinically for us today. So if you ask me to see someone and say, hey, David, is this put, because you're on my first name base with me, right? So we're rocking, you know, we're kicking with the kids here. So we're not probably on Facebook with you on So Modern. Anyway, so there we are. He said, David, please diagnose this person with Demetra. I said, well, tell me, you know, do they have some kind of memory impairment? Because I don't know if I can diagnose it without some kind of clear memory impairment. So yes, they do. I said, well, you know, I really need another kind of cognitive domain to have a serious problem in it. He said, oh, no worries, mate. Got another cognitive domain that's uh, problematic there. And the most common ones include executive function, which is the sort of function that men can't use in supermarkets, right? It's organising yourself, getting motivated to get there in the first place, deciding what to do if that particular uh, type of cream your wife sent you down there to get is not actually there, because you're so inventive you don't have to ring them on the phone. Yeah, that's executive function, problem solving, sequencing, abstracting, planning, that kind of stuff. Stop laughing, girls. All right, so, um, uh, you know, difficulties with with uh, organising and uh, you know putting motor actions into sequence, or aphasia difficulties with you know recognising the things that you see and the things that you hear and so forth, and then you've got to say, well, you know, it's severe enough for it to be the sort of stuff that would put you on disability support pension, that kind of functional impairment, because I mean you know like that's very variable. So is the the functional impairment with which dementia gets diagnosed in real life as opposed to trials. You can't be well, we've got delirium, right? We can't just have a sudden onset of cognitive impairment and then diagnose this in the middle of all this, you know, urinary tract infection. We can imply it, you know, we might hear a long history of someone with multiple cognitive impairments coming, just press all. So, um, right, and it can't, you know, we would obviously think twice if the person had pre existing schizophrenia. That's how dementia has been diagnosed for the last 30 years, and pretty much that's how it's going to continue to be diagnosed for the next 10 years because we really don't have the sort of tests where you're going to go to the doctor and say, I'm really concerned, you, probably, you might say to a, of a parent or something, I'm really concerned because, you know, my parents been progressively losing their ability to, to think and remember things and I hear there are these blood tests. Now, if your parent owns their own business and they score positive, if you were just lucky enough to get into one of the research places in Australia that actually has these tests, then you're looking at maybe, at the, at the best, if you had every single last test that they were doing in those research centres, you've got an 80% accuracy compared with autopsy. Now, 80%, are you going to sell your house? Are you going to sell everything? Are you going to go on that cruise? Don't you really want more certainty than that? Well, depending on what the decision was, I guess. If you want to retire anyway, it might be a, a nice little trigger. So we don't have tests that, we've got tests that just like with, they kind of help you maybe establish it, we, we always ask for particular blood tests and some imaging these days to diagnose dementia, but it's not the tests themselves that diagnose the dementia. It's the pattern of a set of cognitive problems that you didn't have before, that, are, that particularly as you uh, grow older, you might be more at risk of if it was an Alzheimer type pattern or if you had it in the family and, you know, like half the guys in your family had dementia at an early age. Then we want to rule out other things like really severe depression. It takes severe depression to make you look like somebody that might have dementia in the clinic. Yeah, so it's a it's a clinical process. Just like you guys trying to say, well, is this clinically significant depression? Or the doctor wrote depression in the letter. You know, what what did they mean? Yeah. Okay. 
So one of the things about the 65 plus dementias that's kind of true of just about 90% of the stuff that gets diagnosed with dementia in this country is that somewhere in the brain, usually in an Alzheimer's process starting in the, the, the sort of middle, imagine that you're, and this is a terrible aldi we're in, but in this aldi, right, people just push, push their hands right down the middle of their heads and separate their cerebral hemispheres. I'm not going there, I've, I've stopped going there. So anyway, but if you did that, and you'd kind of pull the two halves of your brain apart, that's where the Alzheimer type process kicks off, yeah? There are other types of dementias, like the frontotemporal dementias, which have several pathologies, not just those plaques and tangles that I was talking about, but they tend to kick off at the, at the front of the brain. By the time someone's got really severe dementia, a lot, of the, a lot of the clinical pictures are exactly the same because the process has spread everywhere through the brain. So we tend to rely on the early story of dementia stories to work out, was it frontotemporal dementia, you know, somebody who was always proud of their appearance progressively over a number of years, you know, just appears naked in public or does, you know, sexually disinhibited things, uh, you know, or is it an Alzheimer type story where, you know, it starts off with what seems like just normal forgetfulness and it gets worse and worse and worse until it's there present every day and forgetting is the whole, forgetting of whole events where memory is an early feature. Every one of those dementia pictures has a particular type of early story which we're not going to go through. But well, what they have in common is your brain manufactures particular proteins all the time. We manufacture proteins that keep our body going in a variety of ways. And either because of an inherited cause, which is not so common, or just with the passage of time, particularly if you're into the 70s and 80s, your brain cells stop manufacturing those proteins properly. Yeah? And so what happens is, when, the, when your normal proteins aren't manufactured properly, rather than being semi-fluid, they become all sticky and gunky and they kind of break up the nerve cells from inside or they sit outside the nerve cells and really irritate those nerve cells and the nerve brain starts to attack itself. So that's the shared pathology of a wide range of different types of underlying causes of dementia. Remember how we said the urinary tract infection is the medical condition, the delirium is the psychiatric diagnosis, the Alzheimer's disease is the most common medical condition, dementia of Alzheimer's disease is the psychiatric term. Yeah? Dementia is the behavioural manifestations and pattern. The underlying stuff we can only these days really be confident about at autopsy. Nobody wants to go to that outpatient clinic, I can tell you. But unfortunately, <laughs> that's the certainty. That's the research level thing. Now, if you go to some, you know, a GP or whoever and you know, say, hey, I'm really worried about it. Oh, I've got dementia or you know, I'm really worried about mum or dad. We will make a diagnosis. And I think that we try, you know, responsibly, we will try and make a, a good diagnosis. We have... Yeah, in some lucky places, we have memory clinics to kind of differentiate, particularly the early onset dementias. Uh, but yeah, so it's not that we don't make diagnoses. We particularly just have to be careful that we we know exactly what's causing this. We just, but in in the diagnostic world, we're really wanting to rule out that it's not some other thing that we can actually treat, such as severe depression or lots of side effects from medicines or, I don't know, in rarer cases, you know, mal severe malnutrition and things like this, we might actually be able to do something about. Now, the reason you diagnose anything is because you think you can help the person, but by doing something about it, I mean actually totally reverse or partially reverse the impact of what we're seeing. And in, al and in alcohol and drugs, you, you guys continually help people reverse cognitive impairment every time you get a win or a partial win, but we'll come to that later on. So, um, look, we won't go too much. I've talked a bit about how you get the formation of abnormal proteins. That's the amyloid in the slide. Uh, we won't go through all of that. This slide here, I think, just to try and reinforce this difference between Alzheimer's disease. So on this graph here, if you look down the middle, what's happening here is how you present behaviourally, yeah? Now, I know many of you aren't normal in the audience, but just, just think about all the other people, right? So what's happening in the meantime is your brain is clogging up and clogging up and clogging up with, it, with that normal proteins until eventually, just like when your kidneys fail or your lungs fail or whatever, the, the organ just can't hack it anymore. It says, enough, I'm going to show some pathology here. Yeah? So any of us, for example, in this audience might have Parkinson's disease. The disease, right? Bubbling away in your brain, knocking off enough neurons in that deep part of the brain until one day, and you have to lose maybe 60% of the neurons in this particular part of your brain that, that, that from which Parkinson's disease is the, is the seat, right? You, you look clinically normal, 
up until you lose 60, 65, 70 percent of the cells in the substantia nigra, which is the part of your brain that gets affected in the cases of, of classic Parkinson's disease you might have seen. So any of us might have, um, this is the reassuring bit, right, this is public health, right, you don't get any great messages here, but any of us in the room could be bubbling away with any damn thing and it takes a certain amount of pathology before the organ that's affected says enough is enough, I can't function anymore, and then you start to get symptoms, yeah? So Alzheimer's is the disease process. Dementia of our Alzheimer's type is the set of symptoms and signs that people show. So, um, oh sorry, I keep just showing my own dementia here, I'm just pushing the wrong buttons. Um, well that one's got more colours on it, we need to go back to that one. Uh, uh, yeah, I just made the point before that, you know, different sorts of brain diseases start in one place and that tends to determine the pattern of the earliest features that help, helps us with our diagnostic efforts, yeah? Um, oh, this just shows that, um, you know, you get the appearance of different types of problems from the different dimensions of different types of, of, of severity, yeah? So, uh, we won't go through that either. Um, this one is a little bit handy, I suppose, especially if you've got a psychology role. So, you, because most dementias are progressive processes, the, the earliest neuropsychological features, if you go backwards in time and say, well, they had this, you know, like they had, yeah, memory, memory as in, you know, tell you something one day, remember it a few days later, that was a very early feature and it got progressively worse and now there's multiple other problems. That's a classic Alzheimer story for a person with dementia. So, this slide here, um, just has, if you're especially, you know, neuropsychologists, uh, uh, sorry, psychologists and interests of yours, or cognitive testing is an interest of yours, just illustrates that for different types of dementia, there are different early profiles of different domains of cognitive function. That's all that slide says. I really want to cut through the alcohol and the other drugs. So, in summary, yes, dementia is a psychiatric disorder, just like alcohol dependence is a psychiatric disorder. Alzheimer's disease is an example of the most common underlying medical condition. Dementia is not always irreversible. So you might find people, so some people might argue, well, hang on, you know, should we have this concept of dementia if it's actually potentially reversible? Well, currently, if you've got something in front of you, you've got, you know, we'll talk about when you would, wouldn't, wouldn't make the diagnosis of alcohol later on. But yeah, you can have a small percent of older adult dementias which are reversible. And within alcohol-related cognitive impairment, you have a degree of reversibility. Who here in the audience, I know you guys are out there on, um, what land are they in? Webinar land. Webinar land. Um, who here, they can comment on the webinar actually, yeah, okay. but who here in, the, in our uh, lucky Brisbane audience, it's great here, those of you in the region, so they've got everything, dancing girls, a swan that's carved out of ice, they've got everything, it's true. They get so much more funding here. No, that's not true. They look a bit bedraggled here actually. So, who here has seen that story of someone had really heavy alcohol use, was written off as having dementia and actually got some improvement in there? Yeah, raise your hand, just slightly. yes, half the audience, yeah, okay. So not an uncommon kind of story, particularly again if you if you follow up people from hospital diagnosis through to the community. All right. So having offended everyone in ADS, I'll now move forward to the next slide. So um, yeah, I've already said that you know when making a diagnostic process for dementia, we want a history of the, some decline. It can be very sharp, but it, you know if it's sharp, it needs to have been may have been in a delirium-like picture, but then it needs to persist for a period of time. You need to have, it can't just be, well, I'm really worried about my memory, but your function's pretty much exactly the same. Uh, we need some evidence of that, either from the report of a family member or, you know, which that's where the role of these kind of mini metals and all the rest of it comes in. They don't diagnose dementia, they just give you some confirmation that there might, that what you think is happening clinically really is happening. So, for example, I was asked to see a lady in one of the hospitals who refused to have any cognitive testing whatsoever. She had, she's been a pretty bright lady and had scored 24 out of 30, which is like a research cutoff when they're looking for dementia cases in research, when it was done by community health. But ever since then, she had a history of progressive loss of the ability to look after her home, uh, memory loss that was evident to people who knew her, but she, um, uh, changes in her personality, decline in her function, her house was a mess. She was 78, yeah? so in, in the zone for being at risk of having an Alzheimer's disease story. So she refused to have cognitive testing. So what I did was I spoke to several members of the nursing staff and 
got this, you know, what can she do? What does she need reminders for? Does she remember any of your names? Does she remember anything at all? What does she need assistance with? Yeah. And then in the interview I said, look, um, you need to know that they've asked me to assess you to see whether you've got else, see if you've got dementia. So it's very important that you remember my name and the purpose of the interview. So, and now with me here today, I've got a registrar and he's Dr. Long and I've got a couple of medical students here called Jeff and Sally. So let's just go through that again. My name's Dr. Lee and this is David Lee and this is, uh, you know, Dr. Long and this is uh, Jeff and Sally. Jeff, Sally, Dr. Lee. Got that, right. Yes, you're right. So, you know, yeah, they shouldn't be testing me for these things. I refuse that. Yes, I know you have. So, but just to make sure that you know who's talking to you today, what are our names again? Let's practice that. Oh, I'm not sure exactly. Well, okay, my name starts with a, a, an L, Dr. L. No, you have to say it again. Okay, so I'm Dr. Lee, and this is Jeff, and this is Sally, and this is Dr. You know, so we did this six times, and she just had no ability to remember anything at all. On the surface, she looked socially intact. So I was... Now, this, most of the time, we do have cognitive tests. We don't just try and make diagnoses. But what was at stake here was this lady was going to be taken from her home and placed in residential aged care. So it's a big, big call. I don't blame them for wanting to, you know, to have a process. Because if they send her home, and it's, it's pretty clear and evident to people with pattern recognition that she's got dementia, she's going to be vulnerable to abuse. She would be at imminent risk of serious harm through, through you know, misadventure, getting lost and all the rest of it. That's what she was showing in the hospital, but she wouldn't do a single cognitive test. All we had was that 24 out of 30, which technically is above the research cutoff that they used to look for back in the day. And so some people think now that if like your mini mental's 22, you must have dementia, and you get people who lose their, you know, who have their capacity upheld in QCAT, not so much these days, because their mini mental was 25, so there can't be anything wrong. Absolutely, totally incorrect. Med those cognitive tests are just to help you, just like the blood tests, yeah? That don't diagnose anything. They just put you in the zone. If you're wandering around trying to say, well, you know, I'd like to invest in shares and you just happen to have your mini mental test and it was 29, well, it's okay. It was 13. Someone's got to ask questions. What were you doing that day? Wake up. Anyway, right, this is why people don't work in, that's why they go to the regions and work there, you know. Sorry, <laughs> Bruce. All right, now. So we've talked enough about dementia, so let's talk a little bit about, so there's no test for dementia, no. And we've got this neurocognitive disorder thing, um, I can send resources on that if someone really wants to know about that. Um, these are the particular domains of uh, psychological function that are the most, the ones that are kind of most commonly used in, in, in research and in the new diagnostic things, but we're not going to get bogged down there either, because I really want to get to this, so your world is under 65 world, yeah? So, this uh, is a sort of slide that shows that if you look at people presenting with dementia and then they're all under 65, now you've got about 10% of these cases that are related to, have been attributed to alcohol, and we still have a, a dominance of the, of the um, progressive protein related things. All of the causes there, apart from alcohol and vascular dementia, they've got some kind of abnormal protein that keeps kicking off, yeah? But now you get the real alcohol signal. If you look at people who are diagnosed with dementia in New South Wales hospitals, you get an even stronger signal. So you see the alcohol figure is now up to 20% of those people aged 50 to 65. This makes a lot of sense. There are people who get marooned or are seen by services of 50 to 65, particularly in hospitals. Doesn't mean you can't have dementia under 50, it's just not as common and, you know. But this gives you some idea why people are interested in, in this in um, alcohol and drug services. So. If you really want to know lots and lots and lots about this topic, I can highly recommend because we've really had very few resources in this area until the last five years. So this one, Alcohol and Brain Damage in Adults, put out by the Royal College of Psychiatrists a couple of years ago, it's really good. It covers the alcohol-related syndromes, not just those related to, that have the cognitive syndromes, and it goes over in greater depth some of the points I'm making today. Let me start with something called alcohol-related brain damage. So you can imagine that. You guys are in that zone. You've met lots of people with substance problems. And you've met some people also that have Alzheimer's disease. And you go in and you see this person and they you know, have lots of problems, you know, they, they, they're not very good, with, they're not very good at organising their thoughts and maybe their memory's sketchy but they kind of remember things if you give them cues and reminders. And you know from experience that when this person actually dried out last time, they lost a lot of these cognitive impairments. So you're going to say, well, hang on. I really don't want to use the term dementia for this person. Why don't we say this person's got alcohol-related brain damage? Now, neither of these terms are things that people want on T-shirts. 
I've got alcohol related brain damage. Talk to me, I'm Stacy. You know, nobody wants that either. So it's a stigmatizing term, but its intention has been driven by the fact that this kind of cognitive set of cognitive problems for people with, particularly with alcohol, seen by um, addiction specialists, you know. They weren't getting any traction by talking to people about this as dementia. People were wanting to place the person because they assumed it was progressive and it was only going to get worse and they were never going to get out of residential aged care. And dementia was doing that because all our psychiatric terminology comes with some kind of social cost. Yeah? All diagnoses are social acts, they're not just scientific acts. So, anyway, this alcohol related brain damage in the literature is not just somebody who's having difficulty with executive function. Remember the, the males in Aldi? At any shopping centre, um, or you know, uh, memory functions. I tell you something one day, and I should remember the next. So um, anyway, they went down this line of alcohol-related brain damage, but it's a very big basket of things. So let me try to show you this before we go into this. So this is a poor diagram because I just didn't know how to do the graphics properly. Um, so what it says is that this, the the blue, the dark blue, the whole slide here is something called alcohol-related brain damage, right? And then the light blue stuff are the alcohol-related brain damage syndromes that include cognitive impairment as their criteria. So someone who's got a lot of problems with their cerebellum, you know, shaky arms, can't touch something accurately, they've got another type of alcohol-related brain damage. Well, now we're talking about the weirdest course of course and that sort of stuff fitting. So you could say, well, this person's got <coughs> dementia and it just happens to be something they have. Maybe they've got another kind of cause for their dementia and they just happen to have other evidence of alcohol related brain damage as well. Or you could say, well, there's not many other causes here that I can look at. This person meets the criteria for dementia. They've got alcohol related dementia. Or you could say, well, they've got cognitive problems, they've got some functional impairment, but it doesn't quite meet the severity that I would expect for dementia. I'm going to call it cognitive impairment or cognitive disorder not otherwise specified or alcohol related cognitive impairment. So alcohol related brain damage in the literature is a big grab bag of various levels of severity of cognition and it's contaminated by all the things that people, any of us, uh, run risks to when we start to abuse substances. Not eating properly, maybe smoking as well, getting into fights, maybe having had a pre-existing condition that made us want to drink more, yeah? How do you tell? that it was the alcohol and only the alcohol that led to this cognitive impairment. We don't know. But that's, the, that's part of the challenge. But just to get people's heads around it, they want to call this alcohol-related brain damage and they don't have another clear term to replace it just yet. So this is a mouse or a rat. I'm actually not a zoologist, I'm a psychiatrist, so that's a, that's a limiting factor already. Look, so if you want to know how much, is, how much uh, you know, do you drink or not drink, what's the sort of... Uh, you know, harm minimization if a person's showing cognitive impairment. Nobody knows because they can take a poor little rat like that and, you know, almost take that rat and, and, and dip it, you know, like, oh, I, I don't know, like um, a spring roll into a big vat of alcohol. It takes a lot of, a lot of alcohol to damage that rat's brain, yeah? Whereas, where, what it's, whereas, you know, you look at some of those Korsakoff stuff, you know, which is a range of different things, not just one thing. A lot of those cases, people had malnutrition as well. So it didn't take as much alcohol in the presence of a particular type of malnutrition for that person to get brain damage. But if you really hate rats and you want to kill them with alcohol, or you want to give them dementia with alcohol, you're going to need a lot of alcohol for that rat. Not a lot, of, but rats are small. You don't need that much alcohol. But they can put up with a lot of exposure to alcohol and experimental uh, tests before the brain is actually damaged. So it's not just alcohol. If it was just if you're just drinking pure vodka and you know you had a healthy brain it's actually you need quite it seems you need quite a lot more and people have tried to look at how much alcohol would you have to drink bearing in mind people lie about how they live and all the rest of it what what, what are the people like who get into this well they've got to at least have I'm going to call this five by five by seven so five standard drinks for five years seven days of the week yeah I mean you guys have all sorts of different patterns but for men and then five, five by four by seven for women. So that's a lot of alcohol for some people. It's not much alcohol by some of the things that you see. Nobody knows exactly what pattern of alcohol, what exactly what pattern of malnutrition, exactly how many head injuries and smoke. Nobody knows because it's very hard to do research because you've got so many other confounding factors. The other brain disease that poor person has any other evidence that they might have had head trauma, 
their nutrition, any other substance misuse, particularly, say, these days, methamphetamine, I guess, uh, cognitive effects of other disorders, you know, the, the stuff that's going to stuff up the testing um, because they've got schizophrenia or, or whatever, yeah? So it's very hard to research it. So really, take all this with a grain of salt, if you have salt here. Um, we, we got rid of it in hospitals, it was too expensive. So um, anyway, so there's this alcohol related brain damage and there's a range of things. Now, if in humans, if you look at what's the cause of the damage, it's really clear that there's a lot of evidence that if you drink quite heavily, it puts you at loss, risk of losing brain cells, particularly at the front part of your head, which the part that keeps you safe at, at uh, cocktail parties, the part that, you know, stops you from sending that email, which has become harder now they've got Outlook. Um, <laughs> the you know, that's the front bit. And of course the cerebellum was thought mostly only to be concerned with, with control of, of motor movement, but now is a partner in some of the organisation of people's thinking. And the hypothalamus, which is um, a bit that uh, sort of coordinates uh, our sort of visceral and other reactions to keep us attuned to the, to the, uh, the environment. So, um, the, so the, the actual nerve cells you lose are in those areas. The white matter is, the, is made up of the, 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 the connecting tracks that neurons send one to the other. Yep, yeah, that's why it's coloured white. Now, the good news potentially there is when you do scans of people who's, who are abstinent from a range of things, but particularly alcohol, you can see the white matter restore itself. You've got to be very careful with all those brain scanning type studies. They've got lots and lots of problems with them. They're very gross type of studies. People think they're magic. They show that women are smarter than men or, you know, uh, whatever, or that, you know, women do this and men do that, or that, uh, you know, uh, people who study this, but it's very useful to take it all really, really cautiously, especially if it's in a popular book that's selling very well. Okay. So that's this alcohol-related brain damage within which we have dementia, alcohol-related dementia. Now, where's my Korsakoff? So here it is. So when you, Korsakoff syndrome, when people looked into it, was so many different types of things that it's no longer used, right? The classic cases that I was asked to see as, to train me when I was younger, they were the, sort of, they were the finding Nemo type people. You know, a little bit like that lady that I described before, except much, much more severe. They would forget within this lady I was talking about. She might, if she remembered anything, she might remember it for a couple of days, maybe a week or whatever, or it might last. With people who had this course of course, they couldn't remember anything within five minutes of you telling them. And they and the things that had, you know, they had this temporal gradient, so that things back in the past were well remembered, and then as they got closer and closer to the course of course event where they were malnourished and drank too much alcohol. There was progressive loss of their personal memories leading up to that time. So Korsakoff's is not one thing. You, if you see, it, look, I, people are using it. That's fine. But generally, uh, if I I don't I don't use it in letters. I'll just say this person's got multiple probable multiple causes for their uh, dementia. You know, it's many many years since they've been abstinent. I don't see this. I can't find anything that's going to reverse it. And what are we going to do about that? Yeah. But if you're wondering where the Korsakoff's has gone, it's because it turned out to be no one thing. It was a range of different things. Right, so when then are you going to say that a person with heavy alcohol use has dementia? Well, they should have multiple cognitive deficits. It's nice if they've been dried out for at least three months. And you can see that the, the deficits are just not improving. They're where they are. You can have some improvement up to two years, maybe longer. It's really not very well known. But generally three months isn't a bad sort of thing to say, well, this person looks like they're stuck with these problems, you know, at this stage. But you might allow a few more months. This just doesn't work. You know, it's just a general guideline. Um, they have to affect function. It's unlikely to have been present uh, before before the period of heavy substance use. And you've got to do all those other things that you do to diagnose anything, which is rule out other things. This guy's Carl Wernicke. He should shave. Moving on. Um, so I won't go through all the different jargon that we use. Um, there's another. So he's got a heavier beard there. Mm, okay. So um, I've talked about how Korsakoff's has fallen out of uh, terminology. This slide here. So if somebody's tried to, if you again, if you're a psychologist or a medical officer and you're wondering where's all this heading, they try to validate these criteria. People do try and research against this in literature. If you're really interested in that, that's what that slide's about. Um, if again, if you're in psychology, they're all rather. It used to be thought that people with heavy alcohol use and malnutrition, or heavy alcohol use and other things, mainly have problems with 
new learning, you told them something, you know, now, and then you test them again in half an hour. But in fact, it's more like a dementia type thing because usually with the better testing and better research, people tend out to have problems with organising or recognition of things or, um, you know, visio, sort of this kind of clock face drawing tests which we have here. Don't do this. If you're going for a job, don't do this, okay? Just makes, because you can, if this person, like if you did that, you'd say, oh my God, I'm stuffing this really up. So it's not just a combination of you can't draw, you can't write. Or you can't, it, you know, it's, a, it's kind of like I can see I'm making an error. So I've got a, it's a frontal thing combined with, you know, parts of the brain towards the back that have more to do with recognition of, of objects, plus motor skills, all networked together. Um, I want to finish with, uh, so, you know, when would you say alcohol, when do we tend to say, well, is alcohol contributing to this? Stabilisation or improvement in cognition with abstinence? Uh, I reckon three months for me doesn't. It does, I just that's how I think, you know. And then if it's grey, well, you just you go case by case. The profile includes sequencing, organising, abstracting, planning type deficits, executive deficits, the visuospatial stuff like you might see on using clock face drawing, uh, you know, uh, copy cube and that sort of stuff. Uh, memory difficulties and and relatively intact language function. And then it'd be great if there's other evidence of brain damage like the cerebellar ataxia. Now I want to finish. Can I finish and talk a bit about? Okay. Oh, better. Are there any questions? We'll have. Oh, at the end. Okay. Sorry. So, because I want to. Oh, yeah. One quick thing about. Well, okay, that's all very well. So, uh, what are people using these days when they do? You know, if especially I've got clients like this. I'm getting more clients that actually do have uh, cognitive. What should I use? Um, of all the tests that are there, the ones that we tend to use for for, for the only tests that we wouldn't use there for any adult with any cognitive impairment, 65 plus say, is probably the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which some teams like to use. Now, the, Mon the MOCA has become famous because Donald Trump's GP tested him on the MOCA and he got a full score. So Donald Trump's family doctor said there's no evidence that Donald Trump has a dementing process because his MOCA is fine. Okay, so if Donald was actually a genius to begin with, and you've got concerns about his judgment, planning, and being an elder without assistance, maybe you can see that screening tools don't rule every damn thing out. So, but if you're asking, you know, if you want to know what are things, sorry if your politics run the other way, but um, what, so if you're, if you're wanting to know, well, I've been using the mini metals, is there anything I might use? The MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive, is a 30, 30 square out of 30 type of thing, short, easy to sort of use, and it tends to test more of the deficits that can occur in alcohol-related brain damage, in stroke, those kind of things. It's more sensitive to those things. The, out, the old mini metal is really geared for the world of Alzheimer's, and moderately severe Alzheimer's at that. The RUDAS we use standard across the state for, for people from a non-English speaking background. You can use it for anyone who's had poor education, yeah? It just tends not to load so much on things that required you having gone to 10 years of school or more. Um, You've pro you probably heard of the, the, the kicker and the modified kicker, which is a kind of Taurus and, Taurus and Kate kind of tool that gets used in quite traditional communities. And finally, the ACE3. If you're thinking, right, I'm sick of this mini metal business, give me something more challenging, well, in my teams, and generally throughout the state, we are promoting the use of the Addenbrooke's Cognitive Exam version 3, because it's free, and it does more things than the Mini Mental or the Mocha. And it's also relatively easy to use, yeah? So I can answer specific questions about testing if you want, as long as we remember that testing is not diagnostic, it just helps with diagnosis. Right, what about other substances? So look, again, if I've just found these articles here. If you really want to get really deeply into this and have no interest outside of work, then for opioids, um, I just went and had a look at this sort of summary of, of um, opioid dependent adults and what sort of things are, are there on testing and so forth. What are the highlights from some of that work? Because this is really all relatively recent stuff. Summary, alcohol, uh, sorry, sub substance field, uh, and what do we understand about dementia, cognition, risk factors, reversibility, all really poorly researched. The best of the evidence is in alcohol. Um, so just take this again with the same grain of salt that you can't actually get because we're not paying for it. So 
opioids, heavy chronic use may produce mild deficit. Mild by my Alzheimer in a nursing home type of mild, yeah. Not 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 like it's not life changing or stuffs up people's abilities to engage in, you know, rehabilitation and so forth. Attention, complex working memory and verbal memory. Now, if you want to know what it feels like to have that and you don't want to have like a whole lot of methadone, which wouldn't give you permanent deficits, it might just knock you around. Just remember the last time you had the flu, right? And tried to work or do anything. You know, you have to think extra hard to get stuff done. You need more reminders. It's good if you have a structure. It's nice that you don't try and do multiple things at once. It's hard to stay concentrating in a sustained way over a period of time. If someone tells you something, you may need to be told a couple more times, but you tend to remember it. Yep. That sort of flu-like experience in real shorthand kind of summarises a lot of the pattern across these different substances. They do have di different differences between them. Now the opioids, I think um, they have a much, if you're thinking, okay, well if opioids are going to give you cognitive impairment, shouldn't we show that they actually damage brain cells? So it's very hard to show that opioids damage brain cells, but because they tend to hook into parts of your thinking apparatus that help you solve problems, and also in the, particularly in the hippocampus where you store and organise a lot of memories, it would make sense that if people used high doses of opiates in a non-prescribed way over long periods of time, you might start to show difficulties with those things that I mentioned, plus memory problems, and that's what's shown. But the thing is, like, if I stop using these things, if it doesn't actually damage my brain cells and I stop using the substance, will the brain eventually sort itself out? Well, there's some evidence that that may be true. I think some of the reassuring evidence is that if you look at replacement th therapies like buprenorphine and other things I can't even pronounce because I'm not in your area, um, that's probably safe. Because, I mean, you know, if you raise this issue of, well, opioids aren't, you know, what about replacement opioids? But it doesn't seem that they are particularly a cognitive problem. And nobody's really worked out if opioids by themselves, not taking into account the lives those folk have led, is the big deal that's producing that cognitive impairment. They are associated with this but it doesn't mean the opioids are causing the problem, yeah? Because people who, like, in one uh, study, a buprenorphine study over in the US, about, I think a third of them had multiple cognitive deficits coming and presenting for help, and these were people who um, had variable amounts of ongoing use, and another kind of third had addit an additional milder type of problem. And the ones that really were at risk of cognitive impairment had heavy alcohol and cocaine dependent stories in the background. Methamphetamine, methamphetamine looks like a much more dangerous uh, molecule. Um, so there's a reasonably good evidence that it's actually destroying particularly dopamine, neurons that use dopamine as a neurotransmitter and that it may have on kick on effects into other neurons. Because this glutamate is like the most, you know, one of the most common sort of neurotransmitters in the brain. And too much of a normal transmitter appears to allow too much calcium into some cells and those cells might be permanently killed off, yeah? So if you've seen people who just, uh, you know for sure, are abstinent from methamphetamines and don't, and they, they're kind of like Cheech and Chong together, thanks to those of you from that era can remember those guys, right? The, you know, people just couldn't think straight and seem to organise themselves. It was a cognitive thing, you know, they used to be a high-flying person. You know, there is a, there's much more evidence for methamphetamine being brain damaging than opiates or cannabis. You want to look for brain damage evidence, it's far more there from my point of view as a person who's worked in memory clinics and you know, done quite a lot of reading and teaching around dementia. I'm, I would be much, much more worried about methamphetamine than the three other, than alcohol, yes, would be a, a worry, but methamphetamine more worrying you know, as a substance than opiate and cannabis in terms of brain damage, cognitive things and so forth. Now, it could be there's some reversibility with abstinence, but there's also some evidence that you really can't get permanent down, you just can't get back. And so people have actually, people in the US particularly, have looked at different ways to try and help the deficits that are the consequence of long-term methamphetamine use. What dose is dangerous, nobody knows. How often, nobody knows, all that kind of stuff. They tried ECT, which seems to be helpful in rats. That's good. Uh, any of your rats presenting to your, to your programs? <laughs> uh, and there's a drug called modafinil, but again, there's no clear evidence that there's any treatment for this once it's established. There's some evidence that abstinence can be helpful. Finally, cannabis, again, another re uh, reference there. Look, there are parts of the brain that are affected a little bit like the alcohol story, but this time the 
hippocampus um, gets replaced by the amygdala. The amygdala is kind of uh, a gating type of uh, part of our brain that helps us tag emotional information onto problem solving and memory and a range of other things. And it's associated with the expression of anxiety as well. Now. This is, the, this is the hardest story here. You've probably followed the story about does it cause psychosis? Is it associated with psychosis? What's the nature of psychosis? Blah, 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 blah. Now, well, now be sure that cannabis is, causes the deficits you see because you can imagine the lifestyle and the alcohol. You've got to factor all that in, let alone people telling you when it started and they're telling the truth and all the rest of it. So, yes, it could be that cannabis can cause permanent mild cognitive impairment, but it's also possible that that only occurs a bit like the alcohol story when you've got other things happening. Or maybe it's just those other things and the cannabis was just part of the story. Not only that, there's some evidence that it could actually help older people reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So you've got a real double, you've got to make your mind up here because potentially, from my reading of this, you would put yourself at risk of at least temporary and somewhat lasting, if not potentially reversible cognitive impairment but on the other hand, if you're like a laboratory rat and you're just bonging on, then when they try and give those rats Alzheimer's, there's a poor old species of rats that are destined to get Alzheimer's disease because they've been genetically programmed to do that. And they're a model. So when those... You, this must be a hell of a lab, right? Those poor old mice there running around getting progressively disorganised and smoking dope. <laughs> or however they get exposed. I don't know how they get exposed. Anyway, so, look, thank you for listening to this. Um, you can see there's a developing world of... of uh, so I'd, look, let's have some questions. I don't want to, I've already overdone my time. Right. Thank you. Do you have any questions from the room? What are some protective um, behaviours and mechanisms? Yeah, protective behaviours... Um, Basically, a lot of the things that you read in any sleep pamphlet, the best evidence is exercise. Uh, it probably doesn't have to be intense and aerobic, but exercise has the best benefit for brain protection. You just reduce, maybe you're helping your, um, your brain stay stronger longer rather than reversing the pathology, but yeah, exercise got the best evidence. The next best evidence is probably cognitive activity. So today's activity here is protecting you. The fact that you've got higher qualifications protects you. It may be that it doesn't stop the Alzheimer's, but it just gives you a, a stronger muscle. You know, stronger muscles don't waste so quickly. Yeah? And the, the softest evidence is uh, for social activity. Now, the reason, the reason we want to adhere to the SNAP guidelines, you know, is that they're good for a whole range of different chronic brain disease, uh, chronic diseases, and they include the chronic brain diseases. So there's, the whole area of dementia and how it's prevented and what are the risk factors and what's actually a risk factor but also a cause, it's really hard. Um, there are, I think, the Alzheimer disease type, the Alzheimer Association advice about how you can help reduce your risk is pretty accurate. Um, had a bit of a minor hand in helping to look at the sort of literature behind that. So, like that nutrition. Yeah, nutrition, Mediterranean diet uh, has the best evidence, but that most of that has been research looking at Alzheimer's disease. There's lots of, if you know, there's lots of uh, evidence behind nutrition, but it's better for physical outcomes than for psychiatric or cognitive outcomes. Yeah. Got a couple of questions online yeah. around so people with multiple risk factors for alcohol-related brain um, mm. damage. Any role around education or psychoeducation? Is that effective at all? Well, I think what I've read in this literature is that. On the one hand, it's it's useful because you're going to, you're trying to tailor if you if you if you had strengths in understanding the different cognitive patterns and how you can work around that cognition, that may help you design your treatment tailored program for that person. So that that and in terms of are the you know, if a person's got multiple contributing factors, what can you do? I think the Thiamin story is better known by your guys than my guys. Um, you know, it doesn't. A lot of that stuff about re, re giving people nutrition, uh, providing it's done safely in hospitals when it's done intravenously, that's that's um, you know relevant. Um, and then it's kind of like the the other pattern would be what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So if you've got poorly treated conditions that might help the, the brain thrive, like really badly controlled blood pressure. But I think the thing we say in memory clinic is if you've got you know dad or mum and they love salt on their food, they don't have to stop any of that stuff. They shouldn't be forced to have blueberries or any damn thing because the level of evidence, if, if they want to do that thing and it doesn't cost them an arm and a leg, there isn't, 
then let them do it. But there is no one intervention that you would say, sell your house and do that. You're going, we're going to help you preserve, preserve your brain. For God's sake, you know, buy this uh, brain training app. It's going to save you. Sell your house. Get the money for that. It just you, the, If you look at the trade-offs in either the government's money or your own money, then in general you would choose those things that are pretty much known to, pr to help you with a range of chronic diseases because the best evidence is that that'll kick on into the most common causes of, of cognitive impairment. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any, any toxins to avoid? Is there any yeah, that's, uh, that's um, so the evidence for exactly what causes what is really difficult. The aluminium story, which was about 20, that's been disproven. People have looked at pesticides and the distribution of dementias and other sorts of problems in farming communities. That's pretty soft. It's stronger for Parkinson's disease than it is for um, Alzheimer's. You wouldn't see it on most websites. Um, so they're the, they're the anaesthetics that's been disproven. Some people are never the same after they have uh, chemotherapy. That's very hard to judge. Um, and there may be some reversibility there. They're fairly rare cases. Any other toxins you were thinking of? doesn't hurt to have, does, it's not good to have mercury and lead and other sorts of things like that, but there isn't, you know, like there isn't a particular, you know, avoid this, avoid that. There is, people try, people have tried lots of different ways to try and help people with Alzheimer's, at risk people and people with Alzheimer's, including metal binding uh, drugs and that just hasn't panned out. They've spent a quarter of a billion dollars on every one of those drug studies and there's hundreds of them and they've all failed. If there's no more questions, no more questions? None on webinar land, and Oh uh, yeah, I mean, we talked about thyroid briefly. Any role in ongoing treatment? Oh look, uh, I think if there was um, a talk I couldn't give, it's exactly what we should be doing with thyroid and alcohol. Yeah. I think the physicians have quite lively debates about that. The people who are physicians in addiction land do too. I'm backing out of that. Yeah, that's yeah not going there. Right. Well, it looks like you've answered everyone else's questions. <laughs> so please join me in thanking Dr. David Lee for a very interesting and entertaining presentation. Cheers. No.